have time to read the instructions and questions and check your work. All recordings are played only once. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a man and a receptionist on the subject of joining a surgery. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example. This time only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, I've just moved to Melbourne for a new job and I've been advised to register with a new doctor for my family and myself. I think that this surgery is the nearest one to where I live. What's the name of the road that you live in, sir? Dawson Road. So, Dawson Road is the correct answer. Now we begin. You should answer the questions as you listen as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Hello, I've just moved to Melbourne for a new job and I've been advised to register with a new doctor for my family and myself. I think that this surgery is the nearest one to where I live. What's the name of the road that you live in, sir? Dawson Road. Yes, that's in our area. Would you like to register with us now? Yes, please. Right, I'll just have to take some details. First of all, could you give me your name? It's Mike Jacobs. J-A-C-O-B-S. And your family? My wife's name is Janet, and I have one little boy whose name is Rod. Ron? No, Rod. R-O-D. Good, that's fine. And what is your address here in Melbourne? 52 Dawson Road, Highfield, Melbourne. Highfield, H-I-G-H-F-I-E-L-D. Good. And I'll need to know your health card number. It's N-H-8718-12C. What about my family? Oh, only yours for now. Do you know the name of your old doctor? It was Dr Graham Mackenzie in Perth. Now, we've got four doctors here. There's Dr Susan Larkins, Dr Kevin White, Dr James Nicholson and Dr Linda Williams. Which one would you like to register with? Oh, uh, I didn't think of that. Well, I think I would like a man as my doctor. Uh, I'll go for the last one. Was that one a man? No, that was Dr Linda. How about Dr Kevin? Yes, that will be fine. Right, Dr White it is. Will that be the same for your family? Oh yes, my wife might not want a man as her doctor. Um... Well, we'll leave it as it is for now, and my wife can change if she wants to. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. I'd like to make an appointment now for my wife. She wants to come in at the end of the week. Mm, How about this Friday morning? That's Friday the 21st. Mm, I don't think she can make the morning. Any openings in the afternoon? There are appointments available at 2, 2.30 and 3.30. We'll take the first one, please. OK, that's done. Oh, and what shall my wife do if she wants to switch doctor? She can just give us a call here. Do you want to take the number down? Yes, please. It's 72539829. Can you give me your name, please? My name's Angela, but there are two other girls who might be on duty as well. Their names are Elizabeth and Rachel, but it doesn't matter who's on duty. Anyone can take care of it. Now, what do we do if we need to call out a doctor during the night? We've got a rotation system with the doctors in the area. There's a mobile number you can call and that'll get through to the doctor who's on duty. What's that number? It's 0506-759-3856. Got that. I didn't ask about any charges. 
Like all Australia, prescriptions have to be paid for at the chemist at the prevailing rate. Some things like vaccinations for travel and insurance report we make a standard charge for, and I can give you a price list for those. Consultations, though, are under the National Health Service, so they'll be free. Great. Well, that's all. Thanks and goodbye. Goodbye. That is the end of Section 1. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a man giving a guide talk to new students at a university library. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully to the guide talk and answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to Wesley University Library. This is a 20 minute tour around the library to show you all the facilities and all you'll need to know to start off your life here as a student at the university. What I'll start by doing is telling you about what you need to do to join the library. Then I'll briefly tell you about our facilities and then I'll guide you quickly round and show you everything. So, to join the library, you need to go to the reception between the hours of 9am and 5pm. After that, the reception closes, though all the other facilities will stay open until 10pm. At the reception, they'll give you an application form. After you fill that in, you'll have to give us the fee of £5, which you have to give us every year that you're a member of the library. We will also need to see your university card to confirm that you're a student of the university. And finally, we'll need two passport photos, one for our records and the other for your library card. You will need to do all this as soon as possible so you'll be able to use the facilities at once. I'm sure your workload will begin to build up soon. Now, let me tell you a bit about the facilities. The library opens daily from 8am to 10pm, though, as I told you earlier, the reception operates only between the hours of 9am and 5pm although this is extended to 6.30pm on Fridays to give students more time to organise their book requirements for the weekend. The reception is closed on Sundays. Undergraduate students are permitted to take out four books at any one time and each book may be borrowed for a period of two weeks. Postgraduates may borrow six books at a time. Borrowing time can be extended by a period of one week per book if the student comes into the library in person with the book in question so it can be re-stamped. We do not renew book borrowing over the phone. If you are late in returning any book then you will be charged a fine of £2 for every week that you are late. You won't be able to take out any other books until this fine is paid. This is not a method of earning money for the library but merely what we have to do to ensure that all students have access to all the books that they will need. You now have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the guide talk and answer questions 17 to 20. OK then, on to the layout of the library. We're on the ground floor of the library at the moment. Here we have the reception, the computers, which you can use to search for books and their location, and the bathrooms, which are behind the reception. The rest of the ground floor is taken up by the non-lending section of the library. Here we keep all the books which are either too valuable or are used too much to lend out. You can reserve time with these books at reception and use them during any time that the library is open, but, of course, you may not remove them from the library. 
On the first floor above us we have the art section, which includes books that students will need for subjects such as languages, literature, art and history. On the second floor is the science section. We'll see these in a minute. Of course, individual departments will usually have their specialist libraries in their buildings, though the computer catalogues here will list them so you know where to find everything, whether it's here or in the specialist libraries. Finally, in the basement, we have the stack system, which contains the university collection of magazines and journals that we have collected and to which we subscribe. If there's anything that we do not have or that you can't find, please go to reception and let them know the details. The university operates a swap system with other universities and we can arrange for volumes that we do not possess to be sent here on a limited loan. Well, those are the basic details about the university library. That is the end of section 2. You'll now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a tutor and three students discussing their work. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Good morning everyone. Well in today's tutorial we're going to discuss the essays that you have to submit by the end of next week. Some of you will have already started them which is good and if you haven't well that's okay but you'll have to get a move on. So let's begin with you Simon. Uh, what's happening with you? Well, I've made a start on it. I researched the background quite extensively last weekend, and I should get to the writing stage tomorrow with a bit of luck, and I'll get finished at the weekend. Uh, what are you writing about? I decided to look at the car manufacturing company Jaguar, examine the problems they had with reliability in the 1970s and 80s, how they dealt with it, and how it affected their marketing and sales strategy. That sounds pretty interesting. Any problems with that? At the start I had problems getting information from that far back, but after rooting around in the library I found some magazines which gave me information and also gave me references to find other stuff. It seems now the only problem is keeping to the 4,000 word limit. It just seems I have so much to write about. It seems I'll need 5,000 or even 6,000 words to be able to cope. Yes, your essay title seems to me to be very wide-ranging. Would you think about cutting out part of it? How about looking at their sales and marketing strategy, but only mentioning the problems in the 70s and 80s and not going too far into it? That's a good idea. That will make it much easier to handle. By the way, how do you want us to hand in our work? Do you want us to drop in a hard copy to your office? You could do that, but I'd prefer it if you just emailed it to me as an attachment. You've all got my address. If not, give it to the secretary clearly marked that it's for me. Right, Jennifer, how about you? Uh, I've not really got going on it yet, but I have decided on a subject. I'll try and do some research during the rest of this week, and I should get writing this weekend. OK, uh, what are you writing about then? I want to look into how supermarkets use market surveys to develop their products. Uh, will you have enough time to find out what sort of things that the supermarkets do? You won't have much time for that. I should be OK. I've had a look in the stack system in the library and I found a magazine that surveyed all the UK major supermarkets and a trade publication that analysed the same things in Canadian supermarkets. Mm. Be careful about using their conclusions too much. The university takes a tough stance on plagiarism. Make sure you properly list where you get your information from in a bibliography and try and do your own analysis. Get going too as that analysis will take a bit of time. OK, thanks.
You now have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 28 to 30. And Melanie, how is your work going? I'm a bit behind, I'm afraid. I was sick all last week and the weekend with flu. I've got a subject to think, but I've not done any work on it yet. Is there any chance I can get an extension to the submittal date? The policy of the department is not to give any extensions unless there are extenuating circumstances. Do you have a doctor's certificate or anything? I went to the doctor's, but I didn't get a note, as I didn't realise I would need it. The doctor will have a record of me, though, as I got a prescription. I'll go back and get one. Yes, do. If you get one, then there shouldn't be a problem getting an extension. Without it, though, you'll be in trouble. What subject are you considering, anyway? I thought I'd do an overview of the UK mortgage interest rates and their effect on housing sales trends over the last ten years. I thought it might be of interest because of the huge increases of house prices over the last decade. Certainly an interesting subject, and it should be no great problem getting information, as this has been fairly well documented. It's a lot of work again, though, and you'll really need to get cracking on it, even with the extension, if you get one. Well, I've not got much on for the rest of the week, and I've set aside the weekend to really get to grips with it. Good. Now, is there anything else? That is the end of Section 3. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of an Earth Sciences lecture. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good afternoon and welcome to this Earth Sciences Lecture. Today we are going to look at tidal waves, or more correctly, tsunami. Deep below the ocean's surface, tectonic plates collide, and every once in a while these forces produce an earthquake. The energy of such submarine earthquakes can produce tidal waves which radiate out in all directions from the epicentre of the quake, moving at speeds of up to 500 miles per hour. When these waves reach shore, they can cause enormous destruction and loss of life. Tidal waves are actually misnamed. They are not caused by tides. A more accurate word for them is the Japanese name tsunami which means harbour wave. They are also sometimes called seismic sea waves, since they can be caused by seismic disturbances such as submarine quakes. However, that name is not really accurate either, since tsunami can also be caused by landslides, volcanic eruptions, nuclear explosions, and even impacts of objects from outer space, such as meteorites, asteroids, and comets. Earthquakes, though, are the largest cause of tsunami. Tectonic plates cover the world's surface, and their movement can be detected anywhere in the world. Some areas of the world are more prone to greater movement, and it is in these places that the largest waves can occur. Large vertical movements of the Earth's crust occur at plate boundaries, which are known as faults. The Pacific Ocean's denser oceanic plates are often known to slip under continental plates in a process known as subduction. And subduction earthquakes are the most effective in generating tsunamis. 
a tsunami can be generated by any disturbance that displaces a large water mass from its equilibrium position. In the case of earthquake-generated tsunamis, the water column is disturbed by the uplift or subsidence of the sea floor. Submarine landslides, which often accompany large earthquakes, as well as collapses of volcanic edifices, can also disturb the overlying water column as sediment and rock slump down and are redistributed across the sea floor. Violent submarine volcanic eruptions can create an impulsive force that uplifts the water column and generates a tsunami. Conversely, supermarine landslides and cosmic body impacts disturb the water from above as momentum from falling debris is transferred to the water into which the debris falls. Generally speaking, tsunamis generated from these mechanisms, unlike the devastating Pacific-wide tsunamis caused by earthquakes, dissipate quickly and rarely affect coastlines distant from the source area. Tsunamis are very hard to detect since they cannot be seen when they are in the deep ocean. The distance between two wave crests can be 500 kilometers and because of this, the wave height is only a few feet. Because the rate at which a wave loses its energy is inversely related to its wavelength. Tsunamis not only propagate at high speeds, they can also travel great trans-oceanic distances with limited energy losses. As the tsunami reaches shallow water, however, its speed decreases, but the energy it contains remains about the same. Instead of travelling fast, the wave rises high. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration has set up a seismic detection system to monitor earthquakes and predict the possible arrival of tidal waves for Pacific countries. Boys at sea can also detect water pressure changes that can indicate tsunamis moving through the ocean. But when tsunamis originate near the shore, there is often little chance to warn people. Let's look at some examples of tsunami and their causes and effects. Some can be relatively harmless. In 1992, an offshore landslide caused a tidal wave of only about three feet high that struck at low tide. So Humboldt County, where it hit, got off easy with no casualties. On January 13th in 1992, a Pacific Ocean earthquake off the coast of San Salvador, registering 7.6 on the Richter scale, did not cause any ocean disturbance at all. However, a recent tidal wave which struck Papua New Guinea on July 17, 1998, was 23 feet high and killed at least 1,200 people. This wave was caused by a magnitude 7.1 submarine earthquake. On July 17, 1998, a Papua New Guinea tsunami killed roughly 3,000 people. A huge underwater volcanic eruption 15 miles offshore was followed within 10 minutes by a wave some 40 feet tall. The villages of Arop and Warapu were destroyed. One of the worst tsunami disasters engulfed whole villages along Sanriku, Japan, in 1896. An underwater earthquake induced a wave of 35 feet, drowning some 26,000 people. Finally, about 8,000 years ago, a massive undersea landslide off the coast of Norway sent a 30-foot wall of water barreling into the uninhabited north coast of Europe. If this were to recur today, as scientists say it could, almost anywhere in the world it would cost billions if not tens of billions of dollars to repair the damage to coastal cities and kill tens of thousands of people. That is the end of section 4. You will now have half a minute to check your answers.